Sou Klaus. My talk is not about Sony. My talk is not about companies the size of Sony. They were hacked a long time ago now. Time flies. So many have been hacked since, you all know. Sony is a big company. When they get hacked, it had an impact. Sure, it had a cost. But to them, it was publicity as well. The movie they put out earned a ton of money. They might have made back all of the losses from the hack and more. Companies of that size, of the size of Sony, even if they have make-believe security only, to them, they can absorb the cost of a breach. It's just a cost of doing business to them. So, a hack doesn't really matter if they can't feel it. My talk is about the companies where you don't have the ability to absorb a hack like that. A companies that are small and will likely die if they get breached to the extent that Sony does or did. So SMBs and defending them. I, about a year ago, I quit my position as CISO in a small bank where I spent a number of years building defense. And I love doing defense, that's why I'm here. All my time I spent researching how to defend large-scale defenses for big corps or how to do it for small companies. Small companies have very little money. So I, I, would, I attend a lot of conferences to learn. And there's a hierarchy built by a guy from the US called Daniel Miesler. A hierarchy describing how to make a cool talk. At the bottom of this pyramid, is the not very cool talk. At the top is what you should be focusing on, help people defend better. So I, I created a different type of pyramid for the type of talk that I do, which is a CISO type talk on strategically defending your company and having a chance to beat the hackers. So we need to go to the policy level, we need to reach the CEOs, we need to do things right strategically top down, and that's why I'm here. Some facts about me. In my day job, I work for Peerlist, which is a company trying to break security by curating all the wisdom available out there about security, no matter what topic, and making it accessible to folks like you. I'm on Twitter. I am, I'm also the Cavalry, which is a volunteer effort aimed at making the Internet of Things and connected medical devices, connected cars, secure by design. All right, so security can be a kind of a fairy tale. You go to these conferences and people tell you about what they did, the big tools they built. And it's, it's kind of, huh, do executives care? Do the CEOs care what, about what we're doing? Do we get budgets to do it better? Very rarely so. It's hard, especially in SMB, to get any kind of budget to do anything. You also don't have people with skills that you need. Reversing malware in an SMB? Forget it. You might have a sysadmin, or two, or three. You might have a network admin, but that's the extent of it. Compliance in some industries like bank where I was is what you need to get funding for anything. It's a lever, but it's not security. The security landscape is complicated. How many here know the word Langsec? Turing machines. Langsec is about the fundamental flaws underlying the products that we depend on to keep us secure. AV is well known to not work, right? Who here thinks that having antivirus keeps your company safe? Raise your hand if you think AV is keeping you safe. So, so we are on the same line here. 
AV is usually signature based. The modern tools have new things built in that are having an effect, but tra tradition, traditionally it didn't really work. And then we have all these vendors who come to CISOs like me and have a magic bullet, a silver bullet, a magical silver bullet that I can buy from them. Usually it's an appliance, virtual appliance, or a software package that I can buy and install, and then I can be safe and secure. But it just doesn't work like that. This is from a talk given at Syscan a few years ago, and it's an illustration of how hard security can be. There was a jailbreak vulnerability for iOS, found by Stephen Esser and others, released by Tyke, and Apple patched it. Huh. They patched it, but it was still vulnerable. They patched the patch, it was still vulnerable. They patched the patch to the patch, and still they failed to fix their own software. In the fourth round of patching, when they patched the patch to the patch to the patch, they finally closed vulnerabilities enough so that this chain of attack did no longer work, but they only killed it in one place. The rest of the whole chain still worked after four rounds of patching in two years. And this is one of the biggest companies in the world spending two years to patch what is a critical vulnerability to any iOS user. So, in security, there's something called the defender's dilemma, which some people hate, some people love. Do you know, you might not know of the defender's dilemma, which is defenders have to do everything perfectly all the time, and the bad guys, or in this case the good guys, with an X-wing, just need one photon missile sent into the air ventilation shaft, and you can blow up the Death Star, which is the InfoSec equivalent, obviously, of a vulnerability in your web app, SQLI injection in your web app, or similar, that one flaw can lead to a total compromise of all the data of your company. And if you're an SMB, kill you. That is the defender's dilemma. So, being a CISO, talking to vendors, I really want to trust vendors, but they don't know what they're selling. Recently, the guy on Twitter called Dutmatch, who's working for the CyberUL, the Underwriters Library in the US with a presidential mission, released some statistics that said that, you know, I think it was in 2011, over a period of time, 25% of all the vulnerabilities patched in the US government systems were in security software. 25% of all the vulnerabilities were in security software. Does that mean that we can trust vendors? Or does it mean that when we install security products, we are increasing our attack surface, making us potentially more vulnerable than before? And this, this is a bad thing, if this is the case. Because when you're an SMB, you depend on the tools you have, because you have no people. You need to trust what you have, and then build capacity as you can. So trust is essential. And you don't always know what you're seeing, and might not be what it seems to be at all. So I'm on a mission to try to tell InfoSec vendors to stop being what's called the vendor persistent threat, and to give us trustworthy messaging, trustworthy salespeople, and trustworthy products. It's hard. Because I have no way to tell when I buy something from this vendor or that vendor, they have a similar product. I don't know which is better. I don't know if their support is good. I don't know if it's full of vulnerabilities. And there's no easy way for me to verify. You're basically always buying a black box. They might have been certified. They might have had code review, but still could be bad software. I, when I was in the bank, at some point I hired the most expensive consultants to size and implement a firewall solution. 
So we did a short list of possible brands to go for. We selected one of the leaders in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, and I paid a lot of money for the most expensive guys to choose the exact right model that we needed and implement it. What happened? We spent like a year rebooting firewalls every single day, which is not very good when you're a bank. So after a year, I had to put the very expensive firewalls on the shelf and try something else. And this was using very expensive consultants. It was crazy. But that's the life we live in. All right. So in an SMB, in the situation I was in, we were in with my team that, I, that by that time we had built, trying to build skills, we started focusing on the cornerstone of security, which, in my opinion, and in that of some others that I know, quite many, is the basics. Fix the basics of your security, and like the old Russian saying, when you're in the forest and you meet a bear with your friends, you don't need to run faster than the bear to get away. You just need to run faster than your friends or at least one of them. So if you focus on the basics, making yourselves a harder target for most hackers to take down, you're running faster than your friends. This does not take into account large companies that are targeted by very sophisticated APTs. But it does work for SMBs to a large extent. So this, this is the, these are the Lego building blocks that you should be working with as an SMB. And you should not be moving up to buying security tools, which is the very top step of the pyramid, built by a friend of mine, Joshua Coleman. You should do security hygiene, the basics, and get really good at it. If you can do that and maintain it over time, you have maybe a chance. Situational awareness is hard because you, knew, you have to know what's going on in your networks and in your applications. Has anyone here ever tried opening a unfiltered Wireshark session on a Windows domain? Anywhere on a point in a Windows Active Directory domain? The spam? of background noise is so immense. It's so immense that it's hard to figure out what the hell is going on at all. But with the right tools and a lot of effort, you can actually baseline which endpoints are talking to each other on which ports and when, and then go from there. There's some awesome graphical tools out there that will help you visualize your flows of data so that you can get some kind of a baseline and react to it. The next thing to be thinking about when you're doing the basics is to analyze how attackers are actually breaking into companies and exfiltrating data. And then, like what they did in the NBA, some of the very, very effective teams, they would look at where is this team taking the shots? And not just where they're taking the shots, but where are they actually making the shots? So you defend where it matters. Because if they're shooting from out here, but failing every time, you don't need to defend there. Similarly, hackers will use SQLI to hack your web applications, or they will use phishing. These are the two basic vectors that hack companies. Phishing emails with links or attachments, or basic SQL injection. So for you, your basketball court, is protecting against these two vectors very dedicatedly, and then move on from there once you have a good grasp of that. In an SMB, you go to conferences, some of you. Some of you might go to a lot. You hear about prevention is dead. We need to do threat hunting, proactive detection of hackers in our networks, or stopping them by knowing when they're going to attack and what? Not. But if you're an SMB, <laughs> detecting an attacker is almost fantasy. 
it's so hard. You trust and you have to trust in prevention. But the good news is that while not perfect, you can do prevention pretty effectively once you become really good at the security hygiene, the basics, and then do a few sensible steps. And we'll, we'll come back to that. So what works for the SMB? Educate your management. This takes time. You have to speak the language. You have to kind of explain slowly without putting too much fear into their hearts about how easily hackers could all actually really get into your company. And then you have to just build the trust and just put a little bit more on. If you scare them, it's going to be bad. If you don't do enough, they will never learn. It's the same with your colleagues. Your pre-sales person or your HR or your secretary can become security advocates if they know why they should care about security. Security is not just a department of no, it can be an enabler to your business. It can make things go as good without much of a cost, securely, smoothly, if you do it really well. Ah, oh, this is one of my favorites. I've been saying this for years, but recently it's been backed up in different places in the world, like the FTC CISO, Laurie Craner. Do not change passwords in your company every three months or every one month. Do not do it. Because the forced password changes, if you have this in your domain currently, it creates a race to the bottom where people choose passwords that are the minimum complexity required and then they increment by one every time they have to change it. They start writing it down, putting it on your monitors. Instead, go for long passwords and let them keep them until you have a reasonable suspicion that something could have happened, then you change all of it. And then skills, because security comes down to the people doing it. Many SMBs that I know, they have no one doing security. No one. They have an IT team, which is supposedly also responsible for security, but they don't know how to do it. So educate, build capacity, try to put security in as part of the routines. If you can't get a dedicated person or department doing security, that is essential. For some of the things, you might, you might want to, in an SMB situation, go to a managed security services provider, MSSP, because they might be able to help you with the skills that you just can't acquire. These days, this is probably the best advice on the internet, because ransomware, well, it's going to get you. We heard yesterday here that more than 93 hospitals in Germany have been hit with ransomware so far. For SMBs, the number are horrible. Many of you probably know that SMBs make up more than 95% of the total companies in Europe. Maybe it's even 97%. And they get hit by ransomware all the time. So this one, and you're all thinking, we're doing this, we know this. But a lot of companies, they don't test their backups. If you don't test, you're not doing backups. Another lesson that I learned was most vendors, if you ask them, will come to your place and install something for you as a proof of concept. So instead of, which we did in the beginning, trying out this free download, spending a few weeks with sysadmin time, installing something, screwing it up very badly, ask the vendor nicely, hey, we think this product could be interesting. Could you do a proof of concept? And they'd be like, sure. And then they set it up and install it with the experts, and you save a lot of time, and you get the functionality to work that you actually want to work. Some of you might have seen the blog that recently came out where a MSSP had installed a device in a customer environment that was supposed to monitor the traffic and alert, but it was in the wrong segment. So it couldn't see the traffic at all. It saw maybe 10% of the traffic it was supposed to see, and then when something happened, they got hacked. They called the MSSP, the help desk, and said, hey, can you help us? 
No, we can't. Oh, please help us. No, we can't. They didn't want to help and they didn't have the data. So make sure you get the right people to install it and then verify. In security, trust, but verify. The verification is also important. DPI. We heard about that in talk number two yesterday morning from the lady from Fortinet, SSL inspection. She didn't go into what I would have liked to in details and of why you should be doing this, but it's, it's simple, right? How many of you are doing DPI today in your corporate environments? Someone is hopefully one. Is that it? All right. Um, okay, the reason you should be doing DPI is when you have users who go online and browse the internet, they are going to encounter malware. The malware is going to hack their computers, and you can do very little about it except patch everything that you have, which you should be doing, but you won't be able to actually stop the malware at any point except the endpoint protection suite, maybe, but your new shiny firewall or IPS, it can't look at the traffic. It cannot see it if you do not have DPI. If you do not have DPI, you can't see the malware going through your network. It's encrypted. You need to look at it. More than 70% of the traffic going through your firewall is probably HTTPS traffic and coming from websites that show ads. One of the biggest infection vectors these days is advertisements on normal websites like Forbes, Vice, Motherboard, whatever. Ads hack your computers like no tomorrow. Which brings us to ad blockers, which might not be the next one, but it's coming. Full packet capture. This is really, really useful. Are you doing that as well? Are you capturing all your network traffic? That's too bad, because if something happens, if you have finally built up some capacity so that you have the ability to detect something coming in or something going out, most of what you can do is, huh, some signature did something. Uh, it might be false positive. We don't know. Should we check the computer? Well, we don't know how to do that. So, OK, never mind. And you, you end up not knowing what happened at all. With a full packet capture, you can store it for like two, three days a week, what you have capacity, storage capacity for. You can actually go in, find that specific traffic, which you can or have unencrypted, and look at what happened. Is there an exploit in there? If you don't know how to tell if there's an exploit in there, you have a cert. That is why your cert is there. They will help you if you reach out to them with a net, with a packet capture, a PCAP file, they will take a look for you. All right, so prevention. Preventing hackers. And this works. EMET is free from Microsoft. You can find ways around it, but for most purposes, EMET is hugely efficient. Every time a new exploit kit out there is found or they change existing ones, more often than not, EMIT would have blocked the exploits from advertisements on websites your colleagues go to. My uh, Malware Bytes, they have a commercial product for it. It's also very good for this purpose, protecting the endpoint from exploits. It's really, really good. And then never show a, an ad in your network. Either use ad blockers across all browsers that you allow your colleagues to use, or on the DNS level, firewall perimeter entry, filter out all ad networks, all of them. This will help you reduce the chances of a breach. Application whitelisting is also really, really good because even if malware gets on your computer, it might not be able to run. You might get a file dropped to your drive, but it cannot run normally if only whitelisted applications are allowed to run on the endpoint. All right, so let's say, let's say you build up some kind of defense based on what I said, and then you're gonna, then you're gonna actually start having time to look at what is happening. You're, you're gonna have, have time to start looking at your logs, going through them, 
and looking at alerts that you get in from your security devices that you, of course, trust because they are not full of vulnerabilities and they will catch something now and then. And then you need to reduce false positives. Working with vendors to in improve the quality of signatures is really beneficial because over time you get less and less false positives and then you can react to every single alert that you see. All right, so what I did last year was write down everything that we did for security hygiene for the basics in my previous job. And I created a concept around that that I call minimum viable security, which is related to the word for startups, minimum viable product, where you push out your product as soon as you can before it's really, really ready, just needs the skeleton framework. Minimum viable security is what I think is the minimum you should be doing. And I know you can do it because we did it all. My team and I. Over a number of years, we did all of this. And it's still being done today, consistently. It's doable. No breaches that we know of, ever. But this is the final note. You never know. It's not simple. And you might be a company that gets targeted by someone advanced. And cross your fingers. All right, I think that's what I had for you, what I've collected and tried to build into something that I could share. And I hope it was of some value. Does anyone have questions? Huh. It was all brilliantly clear. Awesome. No questions. Stickers? Feel free to help yourselves to any stickers. I collect them at conferences. I'm the sticker fairy, so I collect a ton of stickers and from one conference and bring them to the next. So, go crazy. Thank you.